PSD EdTech Coaches Podcast, Episode 14, Distance Learning and PE, with our guests, Rick Myers and Ashley Sharp. Welcome to the PSD EdTech Coaches Podcast, a podcast for educators, by educators that love to equip teachers, ponder, and discuss current issues and climate in education. With your hosts, Dan Hopman and Steve Stuckey. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is the Palmdale School District EdTech Podcast. I am Steve Stuckey, co-host along with Dan Hopman. How's everything going, you guys? Hope you guys are having a great week and a good weekend to become. You know, we're ending right now the actual seventh week of stay-at-home orders. Uh, that's crazy, and I just want to congratulate you on reaching level five of Jumanji. Whoever thought we'd be this far? I might even start taking up Dungeons and Dragons at this point. I don't know. <laughs> it seems like it takes a lot of time. And I'm not going to do any more puzzles either. They're boring. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, we, we bought Risk for the boys. Now I have to learn how to play Risk. So that might take us all the way through to August. I'm not sure. So I'd like to start off this podcast with, with a quote. I, I found a quote from a person who knows her stuff. There you go. Celine Dion said, life imposes things on you that you can't control, but you still have the choice of how you're going to live through this. And I think attitude means everything. Absolutely. I, you can't follow anything up with that. I mean, that not that the end of the podcast right there? Well, yeah, no, it's not. But no. uh, no. I have a friend who just finished writing a book uh, called Rising Above Parkinson's by Greg Richer, if you want to find it on Amazon.com. And it's not just about Parkinson's disease, although that's the big thing. He talks a lot about atomic events in people's lives. Everybody is going to go through some kind of atomic event. His happened to be getting Parkinson's disease. And then a few couple years later, prostate cancer and how his attitude and how he's overcome those things. We look at the stay at home as sort of an atomic event in some cases. Teachers surely are because we're sitting here going, what are we going to do? This is out of our comfort zone. How are we going to do it? And part of that starts with how you perceive you're going to do it, how your attitude, how you're going to react to live through it is super important. Attitude is everything. And I know we've talked to some teachers this week who have been in tears because they've been, I mean, it's, they're frustrated. They are where they are and there's nothing they can do about it. They are out of their elements still. And we understand that it's, it's, it's a hard time. It's, it's not easy. It's hard to adapt to that. So one of the things that we'd like to say is that we're, we're heading into week eight and I guess we're just going to sit there and say, it's an honor being a teacher and helping teachers and, Take that because next week is Teacher Appreciation Week. And so you're not going to get the donuts in the staff lounge or anything, but know that uh, we care. We, we're here to support you. Your colleagues are there to help out and support each other. And you guys have been doing that together uh, for seven weeks now in a just tremendous fashion. Congratulations to all of you. Congra uh, thank you very much. Uh, for allowing us to be a part of that. I know we, we, we're just a small part of it. It's you guys on the front line. So thank you for everything you're doing for us. Also, if you, and, and moving on, so not to keep on pondering about how great you guys are, ELD, SLD report card tutorials have been posted on our website, palmdalesd.org forward slash edtech. You're going to have to fill out ELD report cards and if you're at one of the dual immersion schools, the Spanish language development report card as well, check out the uh, website for that tutorial. It's on the homepage right on the front. And also on that same front page of the website, if you scroll down to where it's about our podcast, there's a new button there to click on if you would like to be a guest on our, our podcast. A little form to fill out so we know a little bit about you, what you would like to discuss and talk about during this time. Uh, we would love to have you. And so, speaking of guests, Dan, we've got a couple. Can't wait. We do. Um, two great people. I'm going to let them introduce themselves uh, because I think that there's no one better than to introduce themselves than themselves. 
Who are you? Who's joining us? Well, I guess I'll go first. Um, this is Rick Myers, and I'm coming you coming to you from my my studio, as Steve said, in my garage. And um, a little quick, uh, my journey, I guess you would say. For That's your Steve. dance studio, right? Yes, my dance studio. Oh, okay. I am, yes, my, my dance and fitness studio uh, as best as possible. Um, I've had to learn a lot in the last, what was it, seven weeks, you said? And so... Yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been very interesting the last seven weeks. But um, um, luckily, I think I've had a little bit of training, especially with the tech guys. You guys have done an awesome job with the Tuesday Thursday tech. And so when this happened with me, um, it wasn't a, a shock like I know for for many teachers um, going right to tech was kind of made, <laughs> still difficult. But um, um, yeah, you know, growing up, you know, I think if you asked every PE teacher. Um, how you got, why'd you get into PE? They'd all say, well, I used to play sports and so forth. And so, so yeah, I, I played sports. So I grew up, my dad was actually a PE teacher. And so I kind of followed in his footsteps. And then in 1992, and the job opening out right after college at Cal Lutheran, where I know Mr. Stuckey. That's Let's go Kingsman. That's right. And so I started teaching PE there. And, um, you know, it's a lot of times people say that PE teachers are the planning time for regular classroom teachers. But um, unfortunately, after about three years with budget cuts, they did cut the PE positions at that time. And so I found myself, luckily I had a multi-subject credential and I found myself going into the classroom. So I taught at Ocotillo, shout out to the Ocotillo Panthers, um, for 12 years. And then one sunny day, and this was right when testing was getting super big and they were taking music away. And there was times where you had to do math and you had to do language arts. And I got a call from the superintendent saying, would you like to teach PE again? And I went outside, took me about 20 seconds, came back in and said, yes. <laughs> and I've been there ever since. I went over to Desert Willow, went over to Cactus. When I was at Cactus, I had a little hiccup. And that's where my my uh, great uh, um, partner, Ashley Sharp's going to come in. Uh, and she'll probably help, or she had to, she was a PE teacher at the time as well. And anyways, the hiccup was, I had to go back in the classroom because I have that multi-subject credential. They were making some more cuts. And even though I have some seniority, that doesn't matter. So are I you saying myself, our guest, Ashley took the job over you? Is that where you're leading? Well, to? No, she kind of saved me. I'll t- and she'll probably oh, okay. I'll tell her, tell her story a little bit on how she kind of saved me. But, um, I had to go back in the classroom at the time for about six months. And so luckily, um, I was able to get back into PE, taught a cactus a little longer. Now I find myself at Golden Poppy Elementary and um, I am loving it. But, you know, now with everything going on, um, it's definitely a challenge. And we'll surely be talking a little bit about those challenges as, as we get into this a little bit. Ashley, who are you? Hi, guys. My name is Ashley Sharp. I am the physical education teacher at Buena Vista. Um, Just like Rick kind of growing up, I always played school and was involved in sports. So I kind of had both those backgrounds. And then my undergrad, I went to Adelphi University on Long Island and I studied exercise science and kinesiology. And then I actually tore my ACL my junior year playing softball and I got an extra year of NCAA eligibility. So I stayed and got my master's in physical education. Uh, I uh, got married and moved out to California in 2008 and got hired at the original Cactus over by the planetarium. You you know, it was the original Sage. I just want you to know that because I taught at the original Sage, which was the old Cactus. Ooh, I did not know that. Yes. <laughs> so I taught there and then I went to the Avid Academy, which is now when it was back in trailers in the back of Summer Wind. And then um, when I was at Cactus, I actually moved back east for two years. And that's how Ricky got his PE job back because I left to go teach at a vocational high school in Massachusetts because I'm originally from New York. So when I left, Rick got to go back into elementary or not elementary middle school PE position. How long were How long were you back in Massachusetts? 
I went back for a year and a half. And, and realized then, it got really cold during the winter times well, and you can't beat well, California realized, winters, right? <laughs> I realized I was over snow because it was one of the worst uh, winters Massachusetts had ever seen. And uh, Mary Reese actually called me up and said that they were implementing elementary PE. And she knew that that was kind of like where I really wanted to be was elementary PE. So I came back the first year elementary PE got reinstated and then I taught at Cimarron and Buena Vista for two years. No, Cimarron and Barrel Springs, sorry, for two years. And now this is my second year at Buena Vista. So the question is, was PE always your goal? Was it, you know, I want to be a PE teacher. I went to college because I want to be a PE teacher. To be honest, not really. I wanted to be, my school had a, my college had a program where you could go work for, there were two spots for Nike and two spots for Gatorade. And you could go in and work in their uh, like performance labs. But I was third in my class and they are fifth in my class and they took the top two for Gatorade and then the top two for Nike. I had a, I always had, knew I had a passion for kids and I like did camp counseling and stuff like that growing up. So I knew I had that connection. And then once I tore my ACL and had that extra year of eligibility and had this, I was going for my master's in something, I went into PE and it was, ended up being like, I love it. Like I couldn't imagine myself anywhere else. Rick, was that always your intention? I'm going to be a PE teacher when you were over at Cal Lutheran. Um, you know what, when, during my middle school years, uh, Mr. Tasuda was my, my PE teacher and I thought he was the coolest guy ever. Um, it was so fun playing games and I just loved it. But when I got to Cal Lou, I did of course have a couple majors before I fell back on to uh, PE and, um, but yeah, I think, I think I was destined to be a PE teacher. So you guys, or at least Rick mentioned about, you know, taking the tech classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays that, that we offer, um, what have you learned or maybe forced to learn over the last seven weeks about jumping into this whole remote learning? And I'll let uh, Rick start and maybe Ashley can jump in. Well, one thing for sure is um, with regular PE, you have, you know, two, three, some, ca some cases, four classes coming to you at a time. And I needed to kind of push that to the side and remember that I'm teaching one or two kids at a time now because I, there are only one or two kids in their, in their bedroom or their living room. And so that was something I had to kind of think about, although I was able, it's still kind of cool because I'm able to see the kids, um, but yeah. it's not the same because it's not, it's not 50 to a hundred kids in front of you. It's just two or three. And I need to always remember that. And, and the set they're in is very limited compared to a big gym or out on the field. For me, it came down to, um, I've always tried to implement technology into my lessons in some capacity, but Recently, it's made me kind of step up my game. I actually on Wednesday uh, passed my Google Level 1 certification. So I kind of yeah. used it. Thank you. I kind of used it to kind of coincide with one another. But using the Google Classrooms and I'm learning Flipgrid, it's helped me kind of motivate myself to learn stuff that I probably would have put on the back burner maybe till the summer or maybe not at all. But to see the kind of silver lining of all this is it's teaching me to kind of spread my wings and learn stuff that I might not have learned if it wasn't for this situation we're currently so, in. So what if we were back in the classroom today and some of these things that you're learning to do your remote teaching, are there any things that you're seeing that you might try to incorporate back in when you are live teaching with kids uh, that uses maybe some of that technology uh, to bolster what you do physically outside. One, do you want me to go first, Rick? Sure. Okay. One of the things that I've been doing a lot more since I've been home is the cross curricular stuff. I've been talking to the teachers and what they're doing in class with the, my little kids. We have been counting, like even if it's by five or tens when we're doing some exercises. Um, I'm doing a little more health and nutrition with my students, which I normally don't do in the phys ed classes or when we're outside. So I'm kind of doing some of the subject matter that I normally don't do, but I want to implement that more in the upcoming years because now I have the knowledge and resources for it. So, you know, those rainy days that you actually have resources too, that you could actually focus on, on those health and pro those, you know, those kind of programs and actually do some content as opposed to just the physical education part. 
Definitely. It's helping all of us become more resourceful and um, implement newer ideas for those uh, small spaces and low equipment days, like the rainy days or hot days. Yeah, definitely getting the the health aspect into it is uh, and nutrition and all the cognitive things that go along with physical education is um, is going to be is, is going to be I would have to say easier to present now because we can actually record record us saying it, we won't have the classroom interruptions. Um, unless we're on Zoom Live, of course, you still could have some interruptions. Um, but the other thing too is um, a lot more, you can incorporate the technology where the kids are bringing stuff from home and saying, look, remember you did this yesterday? I did this and they're gonna be experts at Flipgrid, recording themselves, and they can now be the ones that are leading the class with demonstrations because a, a lot of PE is, uh, is movement. What kind of uh, things have you done uh to get the kids active at home when you do have them with you live on zoom i try to keep it somewhat to the same game plan that i do at school i have a warm-up time and usually that warm-up and i do just to let everybody know I, i'm actually using a um, google sites so i have a website where students um they go and they they there's an attendance form they sign in and then um they have uh, they can go live with me every morning and then after that there are videos of me mostly me but of course um, there are some experts out there and there's millions of millions and millions of videos of other people doing stuff, but I know the kids want to see me. So I try to get, get out there in front of them, but I do a warm up, and usually it's a game or, or a, a song or a dance to get that is for everybody K through five that they all like. And then, then we do some fitness and, and we try to incorporate the fitness, making kind of fun. And, and the kids really like the challenges. Um, Ashley will probably be talking about, um, what's called. It's called um, basically the National Field Day is coming up next yeah. week. So a lot of those, a lot of those are one-minute challenges, and so you, t so we tell the kids to get a, some simple equipment like a sock ball or a plastic bag, and we come up with games and we time them, and they can all see each other competing against each other, and so just trying to make it a little bit competitive and keep them motivated. And then there's a little cool down time with either like a yoga session or some mindfulness. So I'm interested. What is this National Field Day? One of my, I want to call it like a side hustle. I don't really know what to call it is. <laughs> I've been selected by uh, U.S. Games. I'm a national, open national trainer. So it's an online physical education network. It's all free curriculum for PE teachers. Is there a website that you know off the top of your head for anybody listening who might yeah. want to go to it? It's open, O-P-E-N, phys ed dot org and it's all free curriculum k-12 to uh for pe teachers and um so being a national trainer i go around the country uh this year i presented at the state pe conference i was supposed to go to salt lake city uh two weeks ago but obviously it got canceled that's a national pe conference i was supposed to present at um, and we just travel around doing professional developments and kind of teaching other PE teachers the curriculum. And they wanted to find a way to have equity of access for all the students that are missing out on their field day. That's like one of the best days for students as an elementary school student um, to celebrate the end of the year, to celebrate all their successes and just have a fun day and not the stresses of school. So they're missing out on it. So what the open national trainers did is we developed uh, open national field day. So it's a nationwide event. Um, it's supposed to be on Friday, May 8th, but most of our PE teachers are, um, are spreading it out during the week because there's 22 events. So I'm spreading the events out during the week and Start, starting Monday, this, May 4th, starting the fourth. Okay. Yep. May the fourth be with you. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> so Monday Nanu, Nanu. they'll start. That's a, Sorry, different, go that's a different show. Sorry, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so um, each day they'll have certain activities. The activities range from one minute activities. Like I recorded my daughter for one of the promo videos doing a towel flip challenge where you have to flip a beach towel from one side to the other without stepping off of it. And then you record your time. They have a Google Doc, which is a score sheet. So I made a copy for all my students as an assignment. And then if they turn them into me, I'm then going to email them a certificate that's like cute and like fun and stuff like that so that's one way we're trying to implement so they don't miss out on some of the stuff that they were gonna have during the school year so, so well, we're excited for that you know, you know pe um has always been compulsory you know you, you have to get your minutes in 
I know before we had PE coaches back, all of the elementary teachers were panicking on how they're going to get 150 minutes in. So it's really great to have PE coaches back in the Palmdale School District. Is it still compulsory? Uh, the state of California for elementary school is 200 minutes every 10 school days. So it's 200 minutes every two weeks. And then middle school is 400 minutes every two weeks. As of last Thursday, the governor uh, knew some waived those minutes. What that looks like for our district is nothing changes. We're all still posting. We're all still doing it. It just comes into like legal stuff that I know nothing about, um, I guess, for funding and fitness tests and stuff like that. But right now the minutes are waived, but we're still going like we normally do. But the compulsory aspect of it is out because of the coronavirus. So does that, does that change how all the PE teachers come together and plan and or is everything pretty much staying the same? Uh, we're pretty much staying the same. We have an awesome group of elementary PE teachers. We meet once a week, every Monday at two o'clock for an hour to kind of go over what our week looks like. We talk about the good and the bad and what works, what didn't work. And then we also have a shared drive where we kind of drop anything we come across on the internet or that we make. And it's a community resource for all of us. And it's been awesome. You know, normally as a PE teacher, we're on our little island and we're out by ourselves, out out by our out in the field. It's not just okay. PE teachers. It, it's, That's true. It's teachers too like to be on an island, All right? Well, everybody's on their island in their house. Yes. <laughs> but um, you know, ever since we started PE back up again, we've been meeting as you know about once a month. We have PLCs. We meet before school starts for the year. Um, we go to the Kaford conference, which is the PE and health conference every year, and so we are definitely um, taking it you know, trying to do our best to um, advocate for PE. We, at the beginning of the, um, as soon as we went on the, co the COVID break here, we, um, we, we quickly got out a fitness video where every PE teacher got together and we sent that out to um, the district and every school was able to play that the first week of school. And we've since then done dances where the PE teachers, along with PE teachers getting their classroom teachers to start doing exercises and um, dances as well to incorporate fitness as a, as a more of a community for the school that when the, the kids love to see their teachers, especially dance. Uh, no, you don't want to see me. That's called ugly dancing. And I don't want that to ever be out on YouTube. <laughs> we'll sign you up. I'm, I'm thinking then you guys are probably now communicating with each other more than you ever have before. And this collaboration, do you guys see that as something that's going to continue? to where you start developing your PE programs district wide, much more collaboratively rather than staying on that Island. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked a lot and, you know, to be honest, I think everybody's kind of sitting at home. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are a little bit stressed with because they have their own kids, but some of us have a little extra time when it comes to planning. I think um, I would think we have some extra time because we're not, we're not, we don't have all this equipment. We just have to sit in front of the computer and try to figure out what we're going to do the next day. But um, I think I've had, I think like four PE teachers call me this week on just simple things with, with how to adding a video or editing or putting a timer on a video. And those are things that I know Ashley's been um, getting hit up by other PE teachers. And we just, we're just like a big <laughs> tornado just trying to figure it out. Every, everyone just trying to hold on and see what happens next. So what about, uh, so yeah, not, not I, every kid is joining your videos, oh, right? Not every kid is joining your videos. You know, it, you know that not, well, and that's same true for every classroom. They're not joining their teachers synchronous time during the day. Um, and so, and not everyone's checking in. How do you encourage people at home, uh, not only students, but maybe even staff right now to stay active and healthy? You guys got any, your, your PE teachers, you got any tips for all of us? So for me, I encourage my teachers to come to the PE classes. And I actually have a lot of teachers who participate. For example, at Buena Vista, the whole second grade teachers, they come every PE class and participate and do the exercises and participate in the activities, which I think is awesome. Today I had the fifth grade teachers in there. And I think it's important that they show support too, because if you have supportive teachers who support you, then the students will support you. And I've been seeing a lot of that. And I, we try to do the 20 minutes 
that we have synchronously with them. But I, they're, they know their goal, even when we weren't teaching like this, is to be active for 60 minutes a day, whether that was recess, whether that's just playing outside or walking their dog or whatever. They know that I have a goal for them of 60 minutes a day. The 20 minutes that they meet with me can count, but they should be active in other ways too. Yeah, we definitely need the, the whole school's got to be on board. Um, we need the, the teachers to keep pushing out either our videos or our website and allowing us to join their classroom as we're all in this together. And if we want PE to be more engaging, we have to be in front of those kids. So have you thought about maybe having uh, teachers or, you know, all that, evidently all staff, you know, we're all stressed out. Um, trying to organize something for the teachers to maybe release their stress a little bit, get them physically active. I'm in the process of doing a um, fitness video with all of our staff, kind of like the PE teachers did in our district where I have the teachers, the principal, all of them are sending me short snippets and I'm going to put that together. And then my next plan is to put a video together of them just kind of narrating how they're staying active to kind of say, hey, it's as easy as this. Your teachers are doing it. How are you doing it? And then I'm going to make a follow-up video with some of the students who are cleared with the permissions of um, the sharing to make a video on how they're staying active. So that's kind are, of like Are we going to have one. to fill out a form to prove Google. that we're actually exercising with you? No, I'll okay. just take your word for it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think um, getting the kids um, engaged, one of the best ways I think we can, what we need, well, eventually, or even whenever we want to get this going, but using Flipgrid and having the kids showing us what they are doing, because definitely the kids want to see themselves and getting them more as the, the leaders of the class or demonstrators is definitely going to be uh, more motivating than just watching Mr. Myers up on the screen. As we wrap this kind of this up, I want you to think, what is it though that you probably miss most about being at school with the kids while you're sitting here at home? doing your remote teaching? I miss the relationships. Like teaching to a computer screen isn't the same as my kids running up and giving me a high five after they figured out how to dribble a basketball with their head up and not looking at it or playing a game that they understand for the first time and they finally figure it out or running their fastest mile, like not being able to be there for them with those accomplishments. And unfortunately, some of my classes for Zoom get up to 90, so I have to mute them all. So it's just literally me talking to a screen instead of having those relationships and those interactions that I'm used to having. I actually only went back to work from having the baby for two days and then this happened. So I got to see all of my students one time and then we got taken off at work. You're so right about that whole presenting to a silent screen. I, you know, my webinar I did earlier today, I finally got done recording it for posterity and said, all right, all you guys still here, just unmute yourself, let's talk because we wanna talk to people. <laughs> we, 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 yeah. People need to connect and, and talking to an empty silent screen is horrible. And I think that's that. a reason, too, that we meet as a PLC once a week on Mondays. Some of the teachers joke is that's the only adult interaction some of us get with the people who are not immediately in our house. As much as I love my two daughters, my stepson and Trevor, we need other people to interact with. And that's kind of why we meet every week anyway, just to even just talk about anything and everything, just to have that social interaction. Yeah, it's a whole new meaning to meet and greet, isn't it? <laughs> and then some. So what are you missing the most, Rick? Um, basically, like Ashley was saying, you know, the, the social connections. You know, a lot of times when we're having difficulty with either a class or students, the more they get to know you, the more yet you get a chance to actually talk to them. And it might, a lot of times it's not even in the, the, the PE arena. It might be just in passing or at lunchtime or before school or after school. Um, it's those connections that, you know, keep that make that make the program great. Well, with that, we'd like to thank you guys because PE teachers really have stepped up as far as this remote teaching goes and are, are doing an awesome job. And thank we you. hope that all of the kids, you know, connect somehow, follow through with what you're doing. We do know that, you know, the exercise is great and it's important, but that they also uh, come in and connect because it's a great thing uh, for people to see each other. And, and to do some ugly dancing, I guess. 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, thank you both for taking the time. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks. No problem. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. All right. So again, a special thanks to Rick and Ashley for joining us today, but it takes us on to another idea. I don't know. I just want to say that I feel like I should have been doing this podcast from my phone walking. So I get that the walking, do, <laughs> jogging, doing some jumping jacks, but it takes us into another realm, which is feedback. We've, we've touched on this many times. Um, it's a new opportunity. And, and, and again, I know it sounds like it's a broken record. It's a new opportunity uh, to use this opportunity as a, for next year or whenever we are back in the classroom. So the idea of feedback isn't just for distance learning. Feedback with, will help your students become more successful in all areas. Like I said, we've said this before, it's going to sound like a broken record over and over and over. But when a student receives a grade, that assignment is now final in their minds. So take the time to provide really good feedback, constructive feedback, and the student will take the time to provide good effort and improvements for their work. Uh, Holly Clark and Matt Miller are two people that we have quoted many times on our podcast. Um, what they say is feedback needs to be followed by an opportunity to do it over. Without that opportunity to grow, it's not really feedback, it's just a comment. Summative grades, they need to happen. We know that. We're, we're almost at the end of the year. I know that's in everyone's minds. But at some point in the learning cycle, we need to make sure we're giving back good feedback. And when the summative grades come, we take care of it when it's time. Provide that feedback. Well, you know, we, we keep it, bringing this up. And, and there are teachers that are taking grades. And, and, and let's be honest. Let's have just an honest moment. We're at a point where kids... Don't do something unless they know they're going to get a grade for it. But that's been the mindset. And I think that's what we've been trying to push on several of our podcasts, this idea that we need to change the mindset and develop students who, who take feedback and continue to have a growth mindset, that student agency of wanting to do something to learn it rather than just to get a grade and play school. You know, we, we, you, you mentioned Matt Miller, um, he quoted uh, Grant Wiggins on his Facebook on his blog about seven mm -hmm. keys to effective feedback. Actually, Holly Clark quoted <laughs> the Ditch Grant That Wiggins, textbook yeah. uh, picture from who took it from Grant Grant Wiggins from ASCD. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look them up. Some great articles, and maybe I'll even include the link on an article about feedback in the description on this. But he said there are seven keys to effective feedback. And, and, and by the way, effective feedback isn't good job. You know, awesome. awesome. <laughs> what were you thinking? You know, uh, you know, things like that. You know, <laughs> what, what the heck is this? Uh, you know, I can't read it. Um, your, your feedback needs to be one of these or all of these seven things. They need to be goal referenced. Uh, help the student reach a goal. Your wording should help them improve what they're doing. You want to make sure that the desired results are clear. You are, they're tangible. They're transparent that it can happen. Uh, students should know what to do with the feedback. So once you give them feedback, they shouldn't be guessing what they have to do. It should be actionable. They can actually go ahead and do it. Your wording needs to be user-friendly. Uh, they should they should really know what to do with the feedback, and that takes practice. And to change a culture of grading and grades to feedback, you really need they need to know what to do with it. And it also probably one of the most important parts. It needs to be timely. You can't wait too long to give them feedback; otherwise, it's useless. It's it's like taking home a stack of essays and then they stay in your briefcase or on your kitchen table for a week before you even get to grading them. Oh, I've collected them on Tuesday. I'll look at them on Saturday. The kids have moved on and you've probably moved on too, to be honest. And now you're just doing it because you want to give them a grade. So think about that. And, and feedback also needs to be ongoing. It needs to be kind of a cycle that when you provide feedback, they get their opportunity to improve and you give more feedback and an improvement cycle happens versus a beginning of a unit, end of a unit, done, let's move on. Continuous opportunities to improve. 
And your, your feedback needs to be consistent. Uh, it needs to be accurate. It needs to be trustworthy so that students know exactly what to do. And they can expect from you honesty, and they know that you're in their corner to help them improve. So uh, uh, feedback, there you go again. We, we hope yeah. that at some point this distance learning starts changing minds of people when it comes to grades and it comes to student learning when we get back into the normal, normal world, if there is such a thing as a normal world. Whatever that might look like. <laughs> well, you know, and in, in, in this new normal, I guess, you know, some students are doing great. They are thriving in this situation while others continue to struggle um, and maybe struggle worse now that they're at home. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, it's very interesting because last night I had a conversation with a friend of mine whose son is in sixth grade. He goes out to sneeze in school in, in Lancaster, sixth grade in Lancaster, is still elementary. His parents have actually found that he is better at getting his work done in a timely manner. He's better at um, at the quality of the work that he's putting out. And, and granted, the parents are very involved in his education, uh, which obviously is a huge bonus for him. And by the way, that's um, probably but, one reason why some people are struggling because there are family dynamics that play a huge part in whether or not a student's gonna be successful at home or in school. Very much so. And so, I mean, having involved or not involved parents has a major effect. Um, however, when he finds that he is struggling, he has time to go find answers or to go ask for help. He's not under a time constraint of the classroom. He has really become in control of his own learning or embracing his student agency and, and the parents are just ecstatic for him. You know, there's no more looking at the clock going, okay, oh, two more minutes to lunch, one more minute to lunch. And then, then the question comes to mind, then it's lunchtime. Yeah. That rigid schedule doesn't play for some kids. Some kids need that flexibility to be successful. Like your friend's kid. Yeah. Or, or uh, the, the, the kid who likes to sit there and tap his pencil and bother the people who need the quiet, you know, he can stand up and go somewhere else. He doesn't have to, you know, tell the teacher, you know, Johnny won't stop tapping his pencil. He can be in control of, of his own environment. So moving on, we'd like to say this, and I think we brought it up at the beginning of the show, and I want to bring it up here at, at the end, is that if we would love for people to be guests on the show, just like we had with Rick and Ashley talking about PE. And by the way, if you've listened to this podcast here to the end, don't forget to thank those PE teachers. They are doing a tremendous job and they are working just as hard. You know, it is not a position where some people think it is of just throwing out a ball and they go out and play. There's a lot of planning that goes on with it and they have a whole lot more kids to deal with at one time. And they've had to move to something from a total outdoor profession to online. So they've, they've done some tremendous things. So if you want to be a guest on the show, how do they become a guest mm -hmm. on the show, Dan? Uh, go on to www.palmdellesd.org forward slash edtech and scroll down to where you'll see the information about our podcast and you will see a button there. I think it says click says, here if you want to be a guest. That's exactly what it says. Fill it out. We'll read it. We'll sit there and contact you and we'll get you on the show. Love to have you guys. So with that, uh, let's end week seven of stay at home orders, quarantine. And uh, I don't want to get a hit by YouTube by playing the song, but you should remember the police said, not the, not the policemen, but the police, the band, as they said, don't stand so close to me. <laughs> <laughs>